Philippians 1, 27 to Philippians 2, verse 11. Life worthy of the gospel. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. In verse 2, imitating Christ's humility. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but to each of you to the interests of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross." Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Thank you, darling. Father, may the words that I speak, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Uh, We're studying through the book of Philippians, and uh, we're going to take about eight weeks to bounce our way through uh, Philippians, and this is our second uh, of those eight um, uh, messages. And uh, there's a common thread in the passage that Anna's just so wonderfully read, Um, And it was an indicator, or it will become an indicator, as to why Christianity had such an impact on the community in Philippi. But as with all scripture, uh, God didn't lay scripture down so that we could read it and go, well, wasn't it interesting what was happening in Philippi? It's for us today. And so by reading the impact that what Paul is saying in this part of the passage uh, and the impact that that had in Philippi, by inference, we could do well to recognise what uh, the impact may be if we don't follow the scripture. Anna so rightfully said, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, and in the words that the Lord has given me to share with you this morning, I will be saying that also a couple of times during our uh, this, this part of the service because God does indeed want to communicate with his people uh, during the Alpha course we have been discovering the importance of prayer of communication uh, between God and his kids and here this morning uh, is part of that communication that God does and um, I'm sorry I haven't mentioned it thus far but uh, it's wonderful to have you here this morning Uh, new faces and uh, not so new faces shall we say Uh, just everyone is here but here's the thing here's the thing Kevin Uh, Kevin gives me a hard time about saying now you say and here's the thing but this is true here's the thing Um, God's invited you here this morning Uh, you may have considered coming to St Thomas to be with friends or to to for whatever reason you're here but actually the essence of it is that the Holy Spirit of God made the way clear for you to be here 
and that you're not here by mistake or you've come to the wrong church or whatever. God has something he'd like to share with you. It might be in a song, it might be in a prayer, it might be in silence, or it might be in this message. So I invite you to open your hearts to hear what God might say to you in, uh, in this here. Now the thing that is, univ- the, the thing, the common thread that is in the passage that is before us today uh, is often talked about in the church. It, the, it's often talked about. It's celebrated when it happens. We tolerate it sometimes when it's in a corporate environment, but we seem to struggle with it when it confronts us and requires a quinonia response. I thought I'd just prove that I did actually have my ears open when I went to college, but a couple of three weeks ago we were talking about what quinonia fellowship is. Can anyone remember what quinonia fellowship was? entails it's the sacrificial coming together putting other people first gathering it's uh it's how the early church were they they saw others needs ahead of their own and it's the uh, fellowship that god desires to have with his people it's uh the official uh Definition is Christian gathering, especially sacrificial, for the benefit and encouragement of another and not simply to fulfill your own taste. So the theme in this passage is not a new issue, as though it's something recently discovered to help express why Christendom is where it is in this culture today. But it's also certainly not to be ignored or lazily relegated to the past, saying that's how the church was then, our culture is now different. Can anyone suppose, from what Anna read, what this common thread is that Paul is encouraging the church in Philippi to grasp? It's mentioned three times. In verse 27, Paul says, Stand firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side. Then in chapter 2, verse 2, he says, Complete my joy, in other words, make me proud, by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. And then in verse 3, he says, But in humility count others more significant than yourselves. And that, my friends, is countercultural for today. I hope we know about the mentions in the scriptures about blessings that come from this unity. We may have read about the early church unity or heard of it when modern revivals happen. Or maybe we we might even understand about the unity that there is between Father, Son and Holy Spirit. But the question I place before us this morning is, what about here and what about today? It may be something that we desire, but what is it that is the prevalent witness to the community Jesus called us and then the Holy Spirit empowered us to influence and impact. If the people around us observed how we get on, how we share our lives and our faith of one voice, of the witness to one God and of one faith, what do we think the community would then see? I'm sure you've heard it spoken about, sadly, mostly through ignorance or even more sadly through a bad experience, that people say, why are there so many denominations? Can't they agree on anything? Well, today's not the day to argue uh, this uh, comment from 
the community, but it certainly is the day to acknowledge and recognise as possibly the biggest humanistic travesty of the history of the church. Not the existence of different expressions of faith. After all, there are multiple colours of flowers, there are vast numbers of species of birds and animals and fish. Sadly, the non-church don't see the unity within diversity. What they see looks like fraction, fractionation and disagreement. I'll say that again. The non-church community don't see that there is unity within diversity. You see, we have multiple brands of cars and televisions and different clothing brands, and as I say, about flowers and fish and birds and everything. God is into making things uh, to have diversity. But you can have unity within diversity. What I'm saying here is that the community often see it as fractionation and disagreement. And often they can be right. You see, there are many denominational splits that have come purely out of human pride, out of selfishness, out of arrogance, suspicion, fear, and too often, insecurity. And that requires one group to be right at the exclusion of the other. We know, don't we, of wars, feuds, relationship destruction, and countless lives that have been taken in the name of doctrine and theology. And we wonder why the world is so cynical of denominational religion. But can you blame them? But friends, there is hope. Firstly, we must always have our reference point, our benchmark in the scriptures. What do the gospels say? The history of the early church, the letters to the newborn fellowship across Asia Minor and Europe. What do these writings say about unity? In nearly every letter or document recorded in scripture, the writer refers to unity at some point. Some churches were good at it, and we will see and we will see the results. But some were not so good. And likewise, there are consequences. The church in Corinth struggled majorly with it. The church in Ephesus and Galatia needed reminding that they were actually all in this together, no matter their background, race, creed, or occupation. The Philippians couldn't get it together, nor the church in Rome or Colossae. Peter wrote about it, as did John. And of course, Jesus spoke of the need for it and attempted to model it with his relationship with the Father and the grace that he extended to us through the intimate pouring out of his Holy Spirit. We still struggle with it today. And hear me clearly, there are consequences to that struggle. The easy way out of the ownership of any consequence is to say, but if everyone struggles with it, then surely that is just how it is. And we can write it off. But I don't agree that that's just how it is. The contrast is incredible when you hear of the outcome when the people of that day did what Jesus told them to and took it seriously. Here's the context. The context is that the Holy Spirit has just been poured out. And the people are flocking to faith in Christ by the thousands. In fact, the story says 5,000 in one day. We're, you read it in Acts 2. But listen to what happens just some time later, as uh, recorded by uh, Luke in Acts 4, verse 32. Luke observes this. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. And the Lord added to their number daily 
Now, pause there and go off text for a second. Because I've just been thinking as I read that. How did he add to their number every day, I've just thought? Was it because they had a clever preacher? Not convinced. Was it because the Holy Spirit drew them? Absolutely without question. But added to their number daily says to me that they have come along and committed themselves to that fellowship. Because it, otherwise it would say, and then the Lord had people visit them daily. It, that's not what it says. It added to them daily. So therefore what I'm believing that they must have seen was a viable alternative to the lifestyle they were living. Surely, if they were then added to what became followers of the way, surely they must have seen something in the unity of believers that attracted them to join, not just visit, added to them daily. Now, don't hear me advocating that we all jump up and go and sell our houses and jewellery and come and throw it all at the feet of the apostles. But imagine what an impact could be made in this fellowship, let alone out witness in the community, if we were so united that we were trying to out-bless each other, out-serve each other, put the other's interests ahead of our own. What would that look like? The recognition that nothing we have is ours. It all belongs to God. All of it. Everything. Therefore, it should be seen as how we can take what is given to us. And remember, God calls us to bless others first with what we have, starting with him, which is often overlooked. The first fruits belong to the Lord. But wait, there's more. We need to understand that God will bless us to be that blessing. We cannot give if we do not have. But out of what we have, we give. And the more we are given, the more we can give. And the more we give, the more God will bless us so that we can give even more. Does that make sense? That the God of creation, who has everything at his fingertips, wants us to bless others, but we can't bless unless we have something to bless with. So the more he gives us, the more we have to bless, providing that we bless. Think about it. I wrote it and I'm confused. Anyway. But we do have so much to give. We have time, we have prayer, we have encouragement, we have money, we have help, and we have food. And this is called kingdom currency. The word for the day, kingdom currency. So let's take something practical and very real, money. Remember, we get money for our labor, and then we use it to purchase other things. In effect, to pay the shop for the milk so that they can use the money to pay others who then use that to pay others and so on. That's the economic system. That's how it works. Money is simply a promissory note that we trade for food, petrol, toys, and a roof over our head. You see, if we didn't have money, we would have to go around and mow the bank manager's lawns and trim his hedges so that we could live in the house for another week. Yeah? Or we would have to go over to the farmer's place and sweep out his yard so that we could have a steak. But that's not how the system works. We get given a promissory note, which is called money. Because it would just be absolutely silly. I mean, I don't know if I want to go around to Pete's place and cut his hedge, to be totally honest. Um, and it's not his money anyway. Uh, he's our bank manager, by the way, uh, and his boss. So money is um, just this promissory note. We take the money, this promissory note, we get for our labour and we give it to the bank or to the butcher or whoever and they do the same thing. And so it goes round and round. And that's the economic system in a nutshell. But a little closer to home example could be the parish finances that we have here. If the money we have is from God, then surely if we use it to bless others, God will see that and bless us back. God wants to out-bless us. 
Really, he does. He wants to bless our socks off. In fact, it is the only time in Scripture that God says, I dare you to try and out-bless me. And it's in Malachi 3 verse 10. And it says this, Bring the entire tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my temple. And then he says this, Test me in this. Modern English, I dare you. I dare you to bring your entire tithe into the storeroom. And then you will see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you so much blessing, you won't be able to contain it. This is the God of the universe that we saw as saying, I dare you to try and outgive me. I dare you. I look at the situation that we here as a parish find ourselves in in this very day, and I witness to the prophetic nature of the scripture that you've just heard. Imagine if we were to take this scripture as truly as we take John 3, 16, 17, the promise of salvation. But as we have no doubt heard, there are always consequences to actions. Sadly, we can also see what happens if we choose to ignore things. So hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. I can hear, where is the good news in all this, Russell? Well, here it is. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's the night that he gets arrested, and he prays this. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So what do we need to understand out of this? What can we actually do? Well, I'm taking a marriage couple, I've just finished taking a marriage couple through their pre-wedding uh, talks that I have with them. Uh, actually, it was Kevin's co-pilot, uh, Joe was, and uh, so he's getting married next uh, Friday, him and Olivia, uh, up at Nati Moti. So I've just finished taking them through their, um, their wedding prep, and I challenge them uh, when they come around um, uh, to try and outgive the other person. They always laugh because it sounds so weird. Weird. Try out giving your spouse. Running to be the person to open the door for the other. Being the first to wash the dishes, to make the bed, to do the washing. Can you see what I'm saying? It's an impossible task. It's just a little bit ridiculous. But that's where it's so misunderstood. You need to try and out give the other with your heart not your efforts or your actions. Those generous deeds will follow. If we do it with our heart, the generous deeds of opening the door and doing the dishes and everything, that will follow. But if you do it the other way round, then you're trying to outdo the other with action. That will build into resentment and hurt. I always put the rubbish out and she never does. I always make the dinner. I'm always making the bed and tidying the house. He doesn't do anything. You see, because that's from the head. If we do it from the heart, when you put your desire to put the other ahead of your own actions with your heart, then everything will come together. God promises to pour out more blessings on you than you can ever give. This is Quinonia fellowship. Marriage is quinonia fellowship, trying to outbless the other person from your heart because you desire to do so, not because you want anything necessarily in return. Quinonia fellowship is unified, it's passionate, it's compassionate, it's sharing and it's caring and it's daring. And friends, it has started in this town. And now I challenge us to exhibit it here with intentionality and authenticity. It just needs a change of heart. 
And through that, we will see a change of culture. We will start to try and outgive each other. Our culture of giving will change. And we will try and outgive God. And the heavenly economy will pour out more than we ever could imagine. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. The currency of heaven will be poured out over us. If we were of one heart, one vision, one intentional purpose to share all the riches he wishes to pour on us in unity and in love, then his blessings will abound. And how do I know that? Because he promises that they will. We will be an example of the richness of his love for his creation. A people who will have this community talking about us. A fellowship that will exhibit the wealth and the resources God wants to pour out on his people so that through us we can be a blessing for the people he calls us to share his love with. The church in Philippi were thanked by Paul for their generosity. And today we see that as they served and gathered in unity, the generosity was released for the glory of God and for the coming of his kingdom. Let us pray, because that is worthy to be striving for. Thank you, Lord, that you are a generous God who loves us so much, extravagantly, lavishly, outlandishly, unreservedly, and to us who are undeserved. You loved us so much that you sent your Son for our salvation. And that same Jesus says, I come to give you life and life in all its fullness. Lord, we want life in all its fullness. Thank you for the abundant life you have in store for those who trust you for our future. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you spared no expense to pay our debt. All things in heaven and earth belong to you. Help us, Lord, to recognize where our resources come from and encourage us to try and outgive you for the glory of your name among us as a witness to the community you call us to be a witness of your love. Amen. going to have a, a time of quiet contemplation on what Russell has shared and on the other things that we've um, covered in the service today. And I've chosen a wonderful song by Ga Graham Kendrick called Servant King. It kind of ties it all um, in together really nicely. And while we're, we're going to play it slightly quieter than perhaps um, would normally be the case when we're singing but still so that we can hear it. And I invite you, if you want to sing quietly along, you're very welcome to, or if you just want to sit there in quiet contemplation, listening for God's voice. He's spoken to you this morning. He's speaking to you this morning. So please, um, if we can just play that down now, Servant King, the video. And um, as I said, feel free if you want to quietly sing along with it, but equally if you just want to listen. We have over here, of all things, a shredder. Um, if something has stirred in you that you want to leave at the foot of the cross, there's a pen and paper over there if you want to. Uh, if you need to say anything to God, if you need to let anything go, if you need to ask forgiveness for anything. Uh, write it down, put it through the shredder. It's the closest we can get to throwing it as far as the east is from the west into the sea of forgetfulness to remember it no more. So uh, avail yourself of that uh, if that's uh, something you feel you need to do as well. Thanks. Mm -hmm.